All right. Welcome, everyone. Dr. Anthony Crenetti, the fourth here, also known as Dr. Finance. Welcome to the Dr. Finance Live podcast. We have an incredible guest today, to say the least. We have Lee Steinberg, one of the top sport, sporting agents ever, sports agents ever in history. He's the inspiration for the movie Jerry Maguire, an incredible, incredible film. Uh, just watch it again recently for Lee. If you guys haven't watched it, check that movie out. Uh, he's also, you know, just when it comes to agency, like representing the best names in business, that's Lee for you. And he's also got an incredible story and he's an incredible individual. So welcome, Lee Steinberg. Welcome, Lee. How are you, sir? Thank you. Doing just fine. Well, Lee, um, how we do this on the podcast, I got a formula, basically about 30 seconds. We'll do a quick snapshot. If you want to just tell us about yourself, quick bio, we'll get into your story maybe about 20, 30 minutes. And then I got about 20 questions for you on various topics that will most likely come back to your story at some point. So, and then we'll conclude. And that's really the formula for today. So with that said, um, Lee, if you want to tell us maybe 30 seconds, maybe a quick snapshot of your bio and your words. <laughs> um, well, I grew up in Los Angeles, went to UC Berkeley undergrad in the tumultuous stage in the 60s. I was student body president when Ronald Reagan was governor. And every time we demonstrated, he cracked down. I learned everything I needed to learn about the art of negotiating from dealing with then governor, later president, Ronald Reagan. Became a dorm counselor in an undergrad dorm. They moved the freshman football team into the dorm. One of the students was Steve Bartkowski. He was the first pick in the first round in the 1975 draft. Asked me to represent him and uh, we got the largest rookie contract in NFL history that started a 48 year career representing 64 first round draft picks the very first pick in the NFL draft eight times 12 players in the Pro Bowl baseball basketball all with the concept of athletes as role models and making a, a difference by retracing their roots and uh, diversified to baseball, basketball, um, soccer, a variety of uh, different sports like boxing. Um, the athletes have raised over a billion dollars for charities. I set up a series of uh, training programs to fight hate and uh, take landmines out of uh, countries and uh, wrote a couple of best-selling books. And, uh, and here we are today. That's incredible, Lee. And, and Lee, I'm just amazed by um, your desk behind you. <laughs> I just, just from what I can see is, is, is enough right there, but I'm sure there's so much hidden gems. Can you give us a quick tour of uh, the pictures behind you? Well, that's on the set of Jerry Maguire. That's Tom Cruise and Cuba Gooding Jr. That's a statue of uh, Tuatango by Loa. That's... Uh, Warren Moon and I, when I presented him at the Hall of Fame, that's an old football card. Um, this is uh, Patrick Mahomes uh, cereal. Uh, wow. That's President Obama. That's Lennox Lewis and uh, Matt Damon on a party I threw for him. Um, that's a basketball from John Wooden. Wow. And all those books, I, I guess they're just, are they your books or the books you, you read? Oh, they're uh, books that I've read. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Th thank you, Lee. So, so Lee, we'll, we'll get into your story now. If you want to take us back maybe to. Oh, let's, let's, let's not forget the globe. Uh, and, let's, and let's not forget Yoda. <laughs> maybe Yoda. He's got his place because the force is with us, right? And he's the repository of all wisdom, great and small. Mm. I like that. Thank you, Lee. All right, Lee. So maybe we can uh, step back. We'll go we'll start with the early years. Where, where are you originally from? And if you want to tell us about, you know, the early years growing up, maybe the first 10 years or so. So I grew up in West Los Angeles and uh, my grandfather ran Hillcrest Country Club, which was the maven for all the movie stars. And he had play Jim Rummy every day with a group of old uh, comedians, Groucho Marx, George Burns, uh, Danny Kaye, uh, Jack Benny, 
and I thought the whole world was old Jewish comedians. And uh, so, and it was sort of unusual. I have a picture with me on Marilyn Monroe's lap and a picture with Bob Hope. And I had an Elvis Presley autographed guitar. And uh, so my grandpa was firmly in the restaurateur um, uh, celebrity business. But <clears throat> my dad raised us with two core values. One was treasure relationships, especially family. And the second was try to make a meaningful difference in the world and help people who couldn't help themselves. So we were hardwired to go out and, and change the world in a, in a positive way. And so that was Los Angeles in the in the fifties, and then um, and uh, my dad was a big UCLA uh, graduate and had played college basketball at UCLA. So I thought the world was uh, the Pope was John Wooden, and I grew up on uh, Los Angeles sports with the Dodgers being the the key and. Um, and then uh, it was off to UCLA for one year and then to Berkeley in the 60s and uh, away we went. You know, I, I didn't know that part about you, Lee. That, that's really interesting. So your, your grandfather, you were surrounded with celebrities growing up then from your grandfather. And, then your, and then your dad had this sports thing going. Which, was that different? It was sports, but he, my father was a teacher and huh. turned away from the restaurant fortune because he wanted to make an impact on young people's lives. And his big passion was the Human Relations Commission of Southern California, which brought all the uh, racially disparate groups together and uh, kept uh, peace and harmony in the city. And so he was a passionate fighter for civil rights and human rights. And uh, as a little kid, I was out, you know, handing out leaflets and, and uh, uh, and when the civil rights movement hit in the 60s, I was a young uh, volunteer. So I had politics in my blood. And you would have thought that at this age, I might have aspired to be a US Senator or, or been involved in, in some cause oriented uh, campaign, but um, along came sports. So would you say your dad and your, your grandfather had were basically very different styles of what they wanted to become? It's, yes. It sounds like that. And uh, there was one day where my grandfather saw my father at Jordan High School, which is uh, deep in the uh, inner city here in Los Angeles. And he saw the way he was embraced by the kids and the difference that he had made in their lives. And he said, oh, well, finally, I understand. <laughs> because before that, the fact he turned away from a restaurant fortune was a little difficult uh, for my, my grandpa to process. And um, so I had these two conflicting uh, impulses. You know, one was for uh, celebrity driven Hollywood and the other was for cause driven, um, make a difference in the world. Mm. Uh, that, that, that's a key part of the story. And, that, and um, I, I appreciate you allowing me to spend a moment on that because that's the foundation, right? Our past is really uh, gives us some clues on how we become. So when, when you were your first 10 years, basically you were helping your dad out with pamphlets, I imagine probably helping your grandfather at the same time right. in the restaurant business. Well, so you get it to see was that a, world. It, and it was a simpler time. Remember, this yeah. is a world before uh, the computer. This is a world before cell phones. This is a uh, a gentler time where you had to use your imagination to create um, uh, uh, entertainment, and uh, you could spend all day on the railroad tracks with a bottle of pop and your friends uh, just sitting throwing rocks, and you thought it was good fun. <laughs> yeah uh my dad always tells me this story i come from i'm in philadelphia uh fifth generation my dad always tells me the stories when they were younger they would put the baseball cards on the the uh the back of the bicycle just to hear the noise and when they find oh, out later it was mickey course. mantle rookie cards yeah it was um um i had what today would be a priceless uh collection of the willie mays and stan musuals of wow. mickey mantles of the world but the primary function 
was you put them between the spokes of your bicycle and they made this great <laughs> flipping sound and up the street you'd roar. <laughs> yeah. What, what was growing up in, so you were in the city of LA, you said, right? Right. We what were, was it like? It, it, we were in the city of Los Angeles and uh, um, it was just a lot of fun. It was, uh, your mother would open the door up on a Saturday morning, you'd run outside the house and you'd play baseball and basketball and, and uh, uh, gun, uh, toy guns and, and rubber band uh, fights and and you'd run around all day and then it would get dark and your mom would call you in and that would be that you'd wake up in the morning and watch uh, cartoons and in black and white and uh, um, and it, there were some great days of uh, television and you'd go to a drive-in movie in your pajamas and and uh, uh, but and it was you know Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts and uh, backyard barbecues and ping pong and uh, and going to the beach in uh, Los Angeles. So uh, you can't really say you grew up on the mean streets of uh, Los Angeles <laughs> because life was pretty idyllic. Even for the poorest people in LA, would you say they still had it relatively better than um, some of the poor neighborhoods in LA right now? Back well, in that I time, would, I, I would because my dad worked three jobs. There were five of us. Uh, we used the same bathroom when uh, <laughs> when our jeans wore out. We put patches on them. When uh, our shoes, we had taps. Uh, we collected grease for. Um, uh, to, to sell for soap, uh, collected bottles and cans, but uh, we felt like we were having a, high, a great life. And uh, later uh, we moved into a, a, a little more affluent uh, neighborhood and I was in culture shock. So even though your, your grandfather had money, your dad just chose a different lifestyle. That kind oh, of- Yeah, I remember that house we bought cost $12,000. And, um, and there were all of us crammed together. I, I slept, uh, my brothers and I shared the same room. And um, we, uh, I always laugh when people thought I was born, you know, in some affluent place. We did, my father got a stock tip and uh, we moved into, uh, uh, j just because of that through, through the family, we moved into a nicer, the poorest house in a very nice <laughs> neighborhood. And um, uh, so for high school, I went to a, a very uh, academically enriched public high school that was actually tougher than anything I faced later at Berkeley or law school. And, um, but they were great uh, days. It was uh, uh, before uh, drugs and rock music hit. And, you know, our big thing was, could we eat on the front lawn of the high school? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they had, uh, your hair could only be so long. You couldn't wear jeans to school. We had dress codes. It was a different era. Wow. So you, you've had your sense of struggles pretty much growing up. You know, you, you know when you were younger what it felt like to, to struggle. And my reason for asking that question as we progress through the story, um, I just want to show, demonstrate to everyone that you became successful, but it wasn't always easy. You, you know, you but, had your... But it was all your uh, perspective, Doctor. You have to understand that um, we thought taking a box out in the front yard and finding 15 ways to play with it was a great old time so that this perception that um, because we had economic struggles we felt somehow uh, oppressed it's just not right we mm. thought life was uh, a hoot it makes a lot of sense but especially when you're when you're a certain when you grow up a certain way if you're if you don't know if you never tasted the the high life yet it's it's all you're just looking at the happiness perspective. Are you happy? Yeah, right. and I, I recall I didn't have a regular uh, Coca-Cola till I was in high school. I mean, <laughs> you know, we would have the off brands, but wow. it, didn't ma it didn't matter. It was, uh, uh, I had a whole street full of friends, a whole school full of friends, and, mm. uh, you know, I uh, got on the achievement track and I was student body president of my junior high and high school and and that just kept going. 
what was your teenage years like growing up? So you, this is like your early years, but you got the t- you were a teenager. You went to high school in L.A., I guess. Right, I did, and it was all public high schools. But as I told you, there was never tougher uh, competition. So I got involved in student politics. I was student body president. I was um, uh, editor of the school newspaper. I did a lot of writing. Uh, I had my own. Um, newspaper back in junior high and uh, elementary school and so I was the editor you know and wrote gossip columns and and really uh compelling news columns about you know the the uh earth shattering events on Corinth Avenue where I live and um and then I was a national um debate champion I uh competed in original oratory and oratorical interpretation and debate. And so that was part of it. I ran track and cross country. Um, and um, um, it, uh, and, and we uh, rocked out to the Beach Boys and uh, Motown and, um, and they were fun times. The whole 60s, didn't happen until we got in college. So we were sort of in the last innocent days. Mm. Politics was uh, Lyndon Johnson running against Barry Goldwater. (laughs) Right. That's very interesting. So, uh, so in your, in your high school years, did you, did you have a lot of jobs growing up? Like, um, you know, paper boy, all that stuff. Cause it seems like you needed to keep yourself busy. You, You have a, active mind and uh, from my experience like myself uh no, we need no, to keep no. I, I i was editor of the paper i was student by the president <laughs> i was running track and cross country i was uh, traveling to uh, states and i had uh, plenty going on and my father took the position that our work was school and um that that we should focus on that and uh it wasn't that we were you know, financially wealthy, but they took the position they wanted us to go to summer school during the summers, and um, and that was our work. And then you wanted to go to college at, you said, Berkeley? Is that right? No, first, first UCLA. Uh-huh. And, uh, it was the John Wooden era, and the center on the basketball team was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And UCLA was the national champion. And then it was the start of the 60s. So it was the, it was rock music. And, um, uh, you know, it was the start of uh, the Doors and Jimi Hendrix and the Jefferson Airplane and, and, uh, and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. And so rock music hit and long hair and tie dye and, uh, and herbal substances and and uh, <laughs> it was a uh, it was a different uh, time and and people were reading uh, thus spoke Zarathustra and uh, and uh, Carlos Castaneda and uh, Sirs and everyone was sort of challenging uh, their own identity and uh, I went up on a trip. When Cal would play UCLA, it was called All Cal Weekend. And I went up on a, a trip to Berkeley, and someone put the headphones on, and the doors light my fire was playing. And I was walking up and down Telegraph Avenue, and there were it was intense energy and and excitement, and it was a student community. And I said, "Oh my God, this is the center of the student world. I have to be here." So I transferred to Berkeley. And uh, and the minute I get there, there's stop the draft week and uh, anti-Vietnam and and uh, a big dispute and there are police all over campus and demonstrations and uh, it was a very and Berkeley was sort of the center of the world uh, for students and I got involved in student politics and uh, and uh, lived in a dorm with dorm president and. And uh, uh, had a, a, a wonderful time for uh, four years. So I, I never asked anyone this question before, but you brought up uh, a, a good point. I, I'm just curious. 
What was, what was that transition like from the innocence of, I guess, the 50s, early 60s to the revolution that was going on in the 60s in people's minds? Um, it psychedelics. A, it was a complete shock because every traditional uh, way of living got, got challenged. It was, um, um, you know, it, was, it went from a sexually very repressed time to free love. It went from um, a time of uh, no substances to, to a variety of, uh, of uh, herbal substances. It went from uh, reading books and, and having lectures that challenged everything about how we were growing up, what the values were, what was right. It was a very challenging uh, time. Today, there seems to be on uh, campuses a certain um, uniformity of opinion um, without much challenge. Um, and, but then we were challenged uh, on every one of our ideas about uh, politics and life and the relationship between men and women. Feminism was uh, coming on really strong. There was, um, uh, and uh, it was a very heavy time of uh, exploring alternative uh, political and lifestyle challenges, spiritual um, uh, concepts, you know, the, the uh, religious concepts um, and testing everything. So Lee, th this is interesting because at that time you were relatively young. I mean, you're, you're basically early college, middle college and things were tra transitioning. And you just said you found it shocking I mean, I, I just think of like the older people at that time. Um, if, you, if a younger person, if younger people found it shocking, the older people were probably so confused. I mean, I don't know how they got through it. Yes, I, I laugh when uh, people talk about that this is the most divided time in the history of the United States. And they use these um, uh, histrionic uh, terms to talk about where we are with the split and all the rest of it. Do they not remember the 60s where <laughs> parents had absolutely no idea what their kids were doing and felt they had lost them forever? And uh, at the 1968 Democratic Convention, the police you know, declared war on the demonstrators and parents were disowning their kids because they had long hair or beards or they thought they were drug addicts. Uh, I mean, there was major separation uh, at that time between generations with the music they listened to, the way they lived. Um, and uh, you're right, there was culture shock um, on both sides. And so um, I happen to have parents who I stayed very close to during that time. So we didn't have any of that. We talked about what was happening. I never was alienated from uh, my parents. We um, stayed close during those years, but a lot of my friends had parents who basically disowned them. And uh, uh, the thing to remember during all of this is that we were students. Uh, so, you know, trying to get uh, to the next level, which was law school. So there may have been demonstrations and there may have been uh, all this cultural upheaval, but, but Fundamentally, I was still trying to get good grades to get into <laughs> law school. You, you know, it's funny hearing that from you, Lee. That, that was a very interesting take on that time. I mean, I've heard it from my dad and his friends. They're probably about your age. And he, he uh, the way they explain it, and I think about today's times, like, so it's like that generation was, was fighting, as you said, kind of what there was a dispute between generations, right? But nowadays, you have Thanksgiving and and people aren't talking in the same family unit because of different political beliefs of all generations. It's like, it doesn't matter to generation. Now it's, now it's just individual by individual. Like you uh, believe the left or the right or whatever. <laughs> it's interesting you say that because I can remember a particular um, um, Thanksgiving where uh, my aunt and I got into a dispute and it got so heated. I remember taking a walk for a while just uh, outside our family home to, to sort of let things uh, uh, cool off. But um, uh, yeah, it was 
very tough. And a lot of it was about the war in Vietnam. Um, and there was the draft then. And what happened was there was a certain time where if you didn't believe the war was a great thing, you might have always backed the troops. It wasn't anything to do with them. I mean, they were risking their lives. But the point is the Viet Vietnamese people weren't fighting for themselves. We were fighting for them. And, um, and the war was never going to end because the North Vietnam was not going anywhere. And so that was a major uh, fight, fighting point and uh, between generations. And um, yet the pressure for men at that point was they eliminated student deferments. And at that point, it meant that everybody going to college drew a number out of a lottery. And in that order of your birthday, they would take you to go to Vietnam. So people were panicked and they would go to draft doctors and draft lawyers and everything. I drew a high number, but there was a day on campus where they drew the numbers and we were all sitting in the dorm downstairs watching this on television. And the people who drew zero through 150 were in deep panic. And uh, the people who drew high numbers meant they wouldn't probably be drafted. So there was all that pressure um, uh, to boot because people were being killed in Vietnam and, and, and maimed and injured. And uh, again, it, it wasn't like World War II where we were everyone was on the same side. I mean, we weren't on the enemy's side, but, but just didn't believe it was a, a, a war with much purpose. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. So after college, you, uh, you, I believe you got your doctor's degree in law, right? Your Juris doctorate? Yes, yeah. so, but again, it was an unusual time when I was student body president one day, Jimi Hendrix shows up at my office, and I showed him around Berkeley. Another day, Jim Morrison of the Doors showed up, and and we were like the center of uh, you know the universe. Uh, Gloria Steinem uh, showed up one day, and so Walter Cronkite would start the news um, <clears throat> tonight from Berkeley, California, from. Ann Arbor, Michigan, from Madison, Wisconsin, from Columbia, New York, the campuses are aflame. So there was a certain feeling like because of rock music and the, and, and, and the counterculture that you were in the center of the student universe. So, uh, but from there I went on to law school and uh, um, then was president of law school and then um, uh, and I was a dorm counselor working my way through law school, living in an undergraduate dorm. And then they moved the freshman football team there in there. And we had other students too. I had a young uh, bearded fella uh, uh, named Steve who kept setting everybody's phone so it rang all the time in the dorm. And uh, that was Steve Wozniak and he went down to uh, uh, San Jose and 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 with Stephen Jobs, they put together Apple computers, and we uh, uh, he was one of my counselees, and uh, we also uh, had a fellow named Brian Maxwell who who founded a company called Power Bar, and uh, but Barkowski was there, and and before I got a chance to choose between different jobs, he asked me to represent him. There wasn't much um, sports law. Uh, there, there was no organized field of sports agency. People could simply slam down the phone and say, we don't deal with agents. I, I just want to step back for some. You said something really incredible. Like you met the Doors, you met Jimi Hendrix. I mean, that's for some people, that's just legendary right there, just that moment. So just trying to understand Berkeley and your role at that time. So Berkeley was a special place that attracted all this interesting talent. I mean, globally, I'm, I'm assuming. Well, people wanted to come. Um, so the student movement was very central to what was happening culturally, politically. And 
So, and, and there was a symbiosis between, you know, rock music, style of dress, uh, uh, politics, uh, books, um, uh, all, all, this all came together in a symbiotic way. And uh, so everybody wanted to come to Berkeley to see what the students uh, movement was up to. And so I met some amazing people. And you, you, your role, because they were coming to your office, was as running the dorms, I guess, well, right? No, no, no. I was student body president. Oh, student body president. Okay. Yeah. So they wanted to, Jimi Hendrix would say, I want to see what the buzz is. I want to <laughs> see what the scene is. And, uh, you know, tell me what's happening here. And, and uh, you know, I showed him around Berkeley. So I'm, I'm just making a connection between what you later became in life this moment was important because here you here you are at a different stage of your life you have you're like a gatekeeper to all the celebrities and that role would assume later in sports just a little bit down the line in your life like you've get you're getting experience to rubbing elbows and letting all the you know being able to talk to a lot of these major rock star figures and people like you, ted i mean steve wozniak i mean that's that's incredible who we became one of the best companies ever you you, be, you were able to meet all these people so well it, it um um i was raised by a father who um told us that that we we belonged in that space and that as long as we were courteous my brothers and i you could walk up to the president of the united states and he might be interested in what you had to say so there was um that sense of uh, not not being overwhelmed by it, um, and and remember, uh, uh, it would be hard to explain today who Groucho Marx was, <laughs> but if you were alive uh, sixty years ago, you know the Marx Brothers were the uh, were probably the central comedic figures of that time. And Groucho Marx had a show called You Bet Your Life. So, um, and, you know, and, and, and Jack Benny and, and, and George Burns were central. Uh, George Burns and my grandfather took me to my first baseball game. And uh, so, wow. you know, it was a different world. But again, that always coincided with my father's admonition, make a difference, make a difference, help people who can't help themselves feel the pain of others, don't just walk by, make an impact. Thank you, Lee. All right, Lee, so we're, we're gonna continue into where you eventually became a sports agent. So you created this industry of sports pretty much uh, as an agency. I mean, it was already there, but the way you basically designed it on your own became, from my understanding, became like the benchmark for everything that superseded you. You wanna tell about that period? How that came so, so it struck me that when I took my dad's core values about making a difference, we arrived in Atlanta to sign the contract for Bartkowski in 1975. And it's the night before. And we, we come to the airport and there are Klieg lights in the sky uh, flashing like for a movie premiere. A huge crowd is pressed up against the police line. And the first thing we hear is, we interrupt the Johnny Carson show to bring you a special news bulletin. Steve Bartkowski and his attorney, Lee Steinberg, have just arrived at the Atlanta airport. We switch you live for an in-depth interview. Well, God, I'm just coming from Berkeley. And uh, I looked at Bartkowski the way that that Dorothy probably looked at Toto when they got to Munchkin land. <laughs> and I said, I, no, we're not in Berkeley anymore. And I saw the, um, the central role that athletes played in communities across the country, how they were the movie stars and they were the celebrities. And I thought, um, <clears throat> if I'm gonna represent athletes, <clears throat> Why don't we send them back to the high school communities that have helped shape them and have them set up a high school scholarship fund and lay down roots and always have a home to go back to. And then why don't we take the college 
environment they played in and had them bond with the alums. And so Troy Aikman set up a scholarship fund at UCLA or Steve Young at BYU or Edger and James at the University of Miami or Kerry Collins at, at Penn State. And then they can bond with those alums and that'll be the genesis of second career. And then why don't we ask them if there's some particular cause they'd like to make a difference in and leave a legacy. And then we'll invite the leading business figures, political figures, and community leaders on a charitable advisory board where they can execute a program. So that would be like uh, work done, the running back of Tampa and Atlanta, um, putting a 200 single mother and her family into the first home they'll ever own by making the down payment and outfitting it. Or today it could be Patrick Mahomes with his 15 and the Mahomes um, making a difference in underserved or kids in hospitals, uh, but all sorts of children's foundations or Tua Tongo by Loa uh, setting up a scholarship fund at his high school. So the whole concept was that we could use sports to make a, a difference in the world by having individual athletes trigger imitative behavior. And one of the things they could do was message. So when I went into boxing later, Lennox Lewis cut a public service announcement that said, real men don't hit women. And that could do more to trigger behavioral change in rebellious adolescents than a thousand authority figures ever could. So, or Oscar DeLoy and Steve Young, prejudice is foul play. So um, I started to build out the practice in football and emphasize the quarterback position because that was the best known and the longest career and uh, steadily built a big practice. And then we went into baseball and did the same thing with my partner, Jeff Morad. Uh, so we had 64 first round draft picks in football and then about 35 in uh, baseball, then did basketball and then the U.S. soccer team in the World Cup. And it grew and, and grew. And I knew that because of the expansion of television, that sports at the professional level is about ready to pop and at the collegiate level and that the future would involve a whole slew of ancillary revenue streams. And, uh, uh, and here we are these years later. Uh, that's incredible. Thank you so much, Lee. Lee, I, I, I want to step back. We missed a scene, though. So from you graduate your law degree and you're friends with Steve, I don't know if I'm saying his last name right, Burkowski, is that right? And he had asked you to become his attorney. Is that right? Before you went... <laughs> was that actually I took a side trip around the world between law school and working. Lee, your vo your vo I'm sorry, your volume dropped down. Maybe it's is this better? Uh no, it just suddenly went lowered a little bit. Is this better? No, no, yes. No. Okay. I'll pause, I'll pause it. Hold on one second. Pause it. Okay. Thank you, for, uh, folks. We had a little tech glitch. We're back. Um, <laughs> so, so, Lee, uh, thank you. We're, we're talking about Lee's incredible story, how he met uh, Steve Burkowski, and that was his first major client, right, right, Lee? That was your first big, big one. Now, Lee, I had a question for you in regards to the movie, and we're going to talk about the movie Jerry Maguire later. But I just watched it yesterday, again, the refresh. Um, it's been a while. I grew up in a video store, by the way, so I got to see all those cool movies. Um, the scene where he meets Cuba Gooding, well, he didn't meet him, but Cuba Gooding Jr. was his main, uh, his only client. Now, I know they jumbled the story up a little bit, even though was, you inspired it. But was that like scene connected to you with Steve Barkowski having the one client? Even though it was a different terms, was there any truth in that that part of it? Well, yes. I mean, at the beginning, I had Steve Barkowski, and if I had lost him, 
as a client, my practice would have been over. And so it just shows the vulnerability. Um, so Cameron Crow followed me to different venues back in 1993. And I remember being back at the draft in 93 in New York. And I had the first pick overall, and that was Drew Bledsoe, uh, who got picked by the New England Patriots. And um, I remember telling Cameron Crow, the writer-director, what would be my greatest nightmare. Well, my greatest nightmare would be finding out that the first pick in the draft was upstairs, and somehow I think I'm going to represent him tomorrow morning. But he's doing something else, unbeknownst to me, and I'm not going to represent him, and that would be a, a clear nightmare. So the thing to remember about the movie is that um, I spent about a year and a half with Cameron Crowe and took him to all the basic events in and around pro football. And I told him stories, lots of stories. Now, he went and wrote a script based on a fictitious character, Jerry Maguire. Um, and that's his script. So I vet the script to make sure the willing suspension of disbelief that holds you in a motion picture didn't get broken, that you didn't think the script was um, uh, unrealistic or phony in dialogue. But what he precisely used of, of whatever stories I told him, you know, is his own um, invention. Thank you, Lee. So, Lee, um, continuing the, the story, and we're, we'll get into to, uh, Jerry Maguire when I start asking questions. We'll tie a lot of this back together. Um, but just to finish up on your story, so you, you've basically went on to represent some of the top uh, sports celebrities out there. Can you tell us a little bit? You know, I know it's, I know you're a humble guy. You don't like to brag, but maybe just some of the, the figures that you represented and then the continuation of, of that story. Well, um, so it, it became very clear to me that quarterback was the most unique position because every game in football starts on the quarterback's face. The games are promos from the quarterback's perspective. You know, here comes uh, Josh Allen and his high-flying Buffalo Bills to play Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs. So that the name recognition is much larger for that player. That means that they have the capacity to do endorsements. They have the capacity to be a great role model and and do charitable events in a great way. They tend to play longer if they don't get hurt in their leg. So I started to aggregate quarterbacks to the, and, and, and back in those days, it was uh, Tony Easton and Ken O'Brien and, and Neil Lomax and uh, Eric Hipple. Uh, and then Warren Moon went to Canada for six years and then sort of broke the color line when he came back in 1984 and became the highest uh, priced player in the NFL because three leagues fought over him. And that same year, Steve Young came into the NFL, excuse me, the USFL, a new football league and signed the biggest as Moon's contract was the biggest in the history of the NFL in 84. So was Steve Young is the biggest in the history of uh, player contracts uh, for $42 million. Um, and, and so at that point, it started to aggregate roughly half the starting quarterbacks in football. And then a number of, uh, of players at all positions. And, uh, and then Troy Aikman came in, into the league and so it was Troy Aikman, Steve Young, Warren Moon, Drew Bledsoe, Mark uh, Brunel, Jake Plummer, and it was quarterback after uh, quarterback, um, uh, and and then players at other positions. Derek Thomas, a standout linebacker and Hall of Fame player, 
and then of the 12 we have ultimately in the Hall of Fame. Uh, and then I went on a run where I represented the very first player in the first round of the draft, six out of seven years. And, um, uh, and then baseball with players like Manny uh, Ramirez and uh, Pudge Rodriguez and uh, Sean Green and Will Clark and Matt Williams and uh, uh, Manny Ramirez and, and then basketball and the U.S. team in the World Cup in soccer uh, in 1994, and Olympic athletes like the ice skater Brian Boyd Tano, and, uh, and then boxing with Lennox Lewis, the heavyweight champion, and Oscar De Loya. And, uh, but all done from the standpoint that the real battle in sports is not labor versus management. And so when people were having acrimonious negotiations because a player wanted more money, all we were doing is pushing away fans who thought all these numbers were astronomical. And I went to owners and said, you have to stop doing this. You have to stop having public negotiations where players are crying to We have to stop having collective bargaining agreement fights with billionaires against millionaires. Our battle is not labor versus management. Our battle is for discretionary entertainment spending. So it really, if you're the National Football League, is with the fight is with the NBA and Major League Baseball and home box office and Netflix and Walt Disney World and every other form of discretionary entertainment spending. So what we ought to be doing is looking at how we exponentially expand the revenue coming into sports. And that means looking at the fact that there are now 300 television stations and the TV networks will bid loss leader economics more money for the in rights fees than they can ever make back in commercials because the, for Fox, a network no one's watching, uh, you know, back in the 80s, this was their key to showing promos on Sunday afternoon that would motivate people to watch Monday through Friday primetime shows. And, uh, push the value of the network, the bottom line value of the network up. And so that's what happened. Fox started bidding on football and it went from $2 million per team per season to $17 million per team per season to 42 million to 100 to 200. And in the midst of a cratered economy and pandemic, CBS and Fox just bid 83% higher on a new 10 year contract than they had before. So the first key to this all was realizing the television revenue potential of the sport and other sports. And we are rolling in television revenue. And then to understand the internet and its power in terms of a method of communication and branding and the rest, and then to understand fantasy sports, and then to understand new stadia with jumbo scoreboards and premium uh, seating and and naming rights and 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 ultimately gambling and how we'll have paramutual gambling as you walk into the stadium. So it it the point was it wasn't enough to represent individual players. I had to help stimulate the revenue that would come into the sport to make it all make sense. Did you ever represent any um, like actors or actresses, any celebrities in that sort, or you just stayed in the lane of sports? Well, you know, here's the thing. I, I love movies. As a matter of fact, I, I funded the Newport Beach Film Festival about 20 years ago, and we brought it back to life, and it's been great. Um, but I, I love movies. I don't want to necessarily know uh, the reality behind this uh, movie star with a drug problem or this movie <laughs> star 
Ladies and gentlemen, I want to enjoy what's on the screen. So, um, you know, I love uh, books and, and, and movies, and, and um, I thought, why don't I just enjoy them and not understand the business behind them? So, so, yeah, like Darren Prince was on here, Darren's uh, Magic Johnson's uh, agent and so many other big um, agents. But he's interesting. Like he actually had a hybrid of both celebrities, uh, like movie stars and sports. And I, I noticed some other folks like him did that, too. Um, and you, what's interesting about you, you just stayed right in the lane of sports, I guess, for that reason. Right. Like you just well, didn't. No. It's all entertainment. So, for example, uh, la last night I went to the uh, Los Angeles Charger Kansas City Chiefs game, and uh, and Henry Winkler is a big fan of Patrick Mahomes. So I spent time with the fawn. Uh, and at my Super Bowl parties, we've had uh, you know Jamie Fox and Jennifer Lopez and. Uh, the Real Housewives of Atlanta and all sorts of, um, of uh, movie stars. And, and so at my Super Bowl party, uh, we combine big business, big politics, and sports, and then big entertainment. So um, there is big overlap because most movie stars also enjoy competitive sports. So you might um, uh, be a, a, a in a box with a certain player, <clears throat> he'll have his movie star friends. So I remember the night before the draft with one player, we were out with Jack Nicholson and, and with another player, you know, with uh, Nick Lachey and Jessica Simpson with, uh, um, uh, and I worked on the movie uh, 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 Any Given Sunday. Mm, so, I like that. All of his stone brought the cast there, or, or I did a party for Lennox Lewis, and uh, we had the cast of uh, Ocean's Eleven there because he had been in Ocean's Eleven, so that was Matt Damon and George Clooney and Julia Roberts and and all the rest of it. So our worlds do come together. I'm just telling you, I, and we do content supply, so we're always looking at ways to package up a sports team, motion picture. Uh, documentary, um, and so we we do those forms of entertainment. I'm just saying I didn't specifically go out to negotiate movie star contracts uh, and represent them that way. Okay, Th thank you so much, Lee. I appreciate that. That makes a lot of sense too. So, so Lee, um, just to wrap up the story, coming full circle, the present 1996, I believe, Jerry Maguire, and um, if you want to tell us about like that up to present, maybe just one or two more minutes. So um, in 1993, a film director, writer Cameron Crowe called me and asked if he could follow me around for a movie he planned to write, which would center on a sports agent. And he had gone underground in a Los Angeles high school to pretend he was a student and he wrote a book called Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which I thought was a hilarious movie. And uh, so I said, sure. And so he came with me to the draft in 1993. And Drew Bledsoe was the first pick there. And he met a bunch of people and owners and teams and was a fly on the wall for my discussions. And then he came to the league meetings in Palm Desert where I was showing off a free agent named um, uh, uh, Tim McDonald. And so he hung out with owners and players and the rest. But he came to a couple of Super Bowls with me, a series of games. Um, he went to Pro Scouting Day at USC. He came to um, uh, my Super Bowl parties, he spent time in my office, and I told him stories, lots of stories. And then, as I said before, I vetted the script. Um, I actually had to show the quarterback in the film, played by Jerry O'Connell, how to throw a spiral, because he had gone to NYU, and they didn't have a football program there. <laughs> and uh, 
Cuba Gooding Jr. I took with me to a uh, Super Bowl in Phoenix, and I made him pretend he was a wide receiver to put him in role. And um, he had to hang out with um, Desmond Howard and Amani Toomer all week to pretend he was a football player. And um, um, so um, it's been, there was a time when Cameron Crowe was at the league meetings with Tim McDonald, who was a safety from Arizona Cardinals at that point, and he asked him what he was looking for in the experience. Well, CNN was on in the background with Lou Dobbs and Moneyline, and Tim gestured towards the screen. He said, I'm looking for a team to show me some winning. I've never won before. I'm looking for a team to show me some respect. I'm looking for a team to show me a big financial contract, and Cameron wrote the line, show me some money. <laughs> and it's been 25 years, and I've rarely walked through an airport or been out to dinner where someone didn't run up to the table and say those four words or ask me to say them to me that start with, show me the money. <laughs> that was a great scene. I love that. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And Lee, uh, just to wrap it up, so you full, going full, full, um, full circle, and basically to present, you are you're here now. You're still doing sports agency stuff. Is that is that right? That's right. But um, one of the things I've been involved with is breakthroughs in biomed, so that the goal is to get players to perform better in critical moments at the end of the game. And second of all, to bring them back to service quicker. And third of all, to try to deal with the issue of uh, concussion and and a degraded brain. So, so this is hyperbaric oxygen. It's stem cells. It's a, a process called light stem that, that stimulates ATP or energy. It's two neurological processes, one called uh, RTMS that operates on neuroplasticity or ways to stimulate the brain. It's another called um, uh, brain training with, uh, with uh, a doctor down in Orlando. And all of this stimulates energy, more productivity. And for people like us, the opportunity to have better memory, quicker uh, recall, faster neural processing, and if you do, um, there's an Israeli study that shows that if you do 40 sessions of hyperbaric oxygen, it gives you 20% better ability to extend the telomeres in your body, which are the building blocks to how long you live and what your health is. So we have breakthroughs now occurring in, in processes and protocols uh, health-wise that are going to revolutionize not just sports, but for everyday people are going to let them live longer with better cognitive function. And I'm working on that as a project. That's incredible. Thank you, Lee. Appreciate that. So, Lee, we're going to move into the questions now. I, I got about 20 questions for you, and it ties back into your story. So uh, this, is, this is the fun part. Um, the, you had a great story, by the way. You, you have a great story. Uh, in particular, though, I want to start with, because I know you're a learned man. You read a lot, um, and I'm, I'm a book guy, too. I like to think that I'm a writer first before anything. Um, love to know what, if you, if you can just talk about your books, maybe some of the books that you wrote, um, maybe if you want to show them. Um, the floor is yours, Lee. Well, first of all, I have a book club on Facebook. So if you're a reader and you're looking for other readers, go to Lee Steinberg Book Club on Facebook. Oh, wow. We, got, we have 2,500 members and we share books with each other. Um, and I was raised by a librarian, so I read three or four <laughs> books a week. Uh, the first book I wrote was Winning with Integrity, How to Get What You Want Without Losing Your Soul which are the 12 core tenants in negotiation. We all negotiate, 
And we don't think of it that way because moms negotiate with uh, 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 dads for curfew for their kids and parents negotiate for where they're going to go on vacation and people buy cars and homes and people negotiate for their own jobs. So this shows you win-win negotiating, how you can, through listening skills, get in the heart and mind of another person and see the world the way they see it. And come out with a uh, with mutually compatible uh, goals and a paradigm of cooperation. And then the next book I wrote was called The Agent, and that sort of is an autobiography. It takes me from uh, the days back at Hillcrest all the way through 2014. And I just signed a book contract to do a third book, which will be the com comeback, which will uh, take me from the early 2000s to a battle that I had uh, with alcoholism, uh, where I pretty much crashed back in 2010, and 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 how I overcame that. I'm now 12 and a half years of continuous sobriety, and then how I rebuilt um, my business, and um, so that'll be that. And then I've written. Um, chapters for a number of different um, um, anthologies like Chicken Soup for the Soul. You were in the um, Chicken Soup for the Soul? Wow, that's I, pretty cool. I a chapter for the Chicken Soup for the Soul. Um, wow. and, uh, uh, again, the best business book you'll like to read will see the title of my book. But I wrote for Forbes for a number of years, and uh, now I write occasionally for the LA opinion pieces um but i love books wow that's incredible yeah uh, mark victor hansen I'm, I'm putting a mastermind together in arizona in march and mark and my mentor sharon lecter they're going to be some of the key speakers here mark you know being chicken soup for the soul guy with jack canfield that's better than hannibal lecter <laughs> so so lee that, that's incredible so you got three books and then you know basically uh different chapters and in, in different uh, uh, books as well that's incredible all right so so thanks lee so next question is we already talked about this but maybe if we can summarize in a minute minute or less um just as a separate question well your your role in the, the movie jerry Maguire, you inspired the movie it wasn't you just to clarify um but you inspired it and you had a lot of impact in other ways so again, the director followed me for a year and a half. He did all every activity you could do as an agent together. Um, he's a brilliant comedian, a very funny characterization uh, uh, writer. And there's a lot of life up there on the screen, but it's not autobiographical because it would not be a very good movie if you start with the first pick in the draft and get the biggest contract. There's not a whole lot of conflict in that. and you need conflict and resolution. What's your favorite part in the movie? Um, probably the relationship between him, uh, between Jerry Maguire and Rod Tidwell. Yeah. And, uh, that largely, uh, I can't go into Cameron's mind, but he saw the relationship between the player Warren Moon who uh, is in the Hall of Fame, and I represented Warren for uh, 23 years, six in Canada and 17 in the NFL. And, and I think, uh, um, I, I think it humanized the whole concept of sports agency. You know, going back to what we were talking about before, I think when Karen's mind, and I don't know for sure, but the way I viewed it, it seemed like he combined two of your events in one. So the Steve Barkowski was, uh, the guy, the your number one, your your last remaining client, or your only client, right? Which would also have been Cuba Gooding Jr. And also the Warren Moon, who was the guy that you had that friendship with, that deep friendship. I think he captured both of them and put them into one person, Cuba Gooding Jr. Again, all I know is <laughs> uh, I shared that time with him, and he's a brilliant writer. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Lee. All right, Lee, so next question. Um, if you can just give us like a quick 
synopsis of the sports agency industry? Um, Cause I'm trying to piece all these things together. It seemed like you basically created a different way to look at the industry. Now I, I also interviewed a guy named Bob Bodine who supposedly um, created the sports executive recruiting uh, part of, of recruiting Bob Bodine. That's different than what you have done. You're, you're the age, actual agent. Where does this all tie in? And maybe you can tell us a little bit of the story of this. Cause um, I, I don't know if you also know, I, I um, interviewed Joe Foster. He's the founder of, of Reebok. And this story was interesting because as the apparel industry was growing, it was tying into the growth of the sports industry. Somehow they all merged at, at the sponsorship level. So just so love your we, thoughts. We, um, so in addition to representing star players one-on-one, -on -one, we also created businesses like I just told you about the health and wellness business that we're working on now. So one of them was something called Athlete Direct, and it was back in the late 90s. It was the first website that featured athletes. Michael Jordan was the big basketball player, Ken Griffey Jr., the big baseball player. And we created a company called Athlete Direct where you could directly talk to um, athletes on the internet and they did their weekly diaries. They talked about their charitable foundation. We designed a unique commerce application. So um, this was an advance over uh, anything that had been before. Also created a huge marketing company that we sold. Um, so uh, the overlap comes where we've created uh, companies in the space that combine marketing, combine consumer uh, demand, and uh, been very entrepreneurial with the ability to see new uh, concepts. So, for example, the, the, to be able to visualize these breakthroughs in medicine and, and biomed and preventative health and understand how they apply to sports, but then if you can validate the concept in sports, that takes you to the larger market, which is um, all of us who are over 30 and then weekend warriors and everyone else. So the reality is that these are all niches. Uh, Bob Codine does a, a great job of, uh, of pairing up uh, college programs with the right coaches and the right executives. Um, each part of this, so we have a symbiotic relationship with shoe companies because they need the athletes. So we all are part of this massive world and we interact positively together. That's brilliant, Lee. Before you came on the scene though, can you describe the, um, the sports agency world was it just from from the movie um it seems like there was just sports marketing international or something like that there was one company that ran it all is that, is that right or yeah at the, here, here was the point players negotiated for themselves and for example in the nfl before 1993 the first 20 years i did this teams had a contract that players had to sign that if they came to the end of the contract, their incumbent team could renew them for one additional year by paying the last year's salary on the contract plus 10%. So let's assume that a player was making $500,000 and his market value was a million five. The team could take the 500 and say, okay, 10%, 50,000, you're going to make 550,000 next year. And your only alternative choice, if you don't agree to our offer, is to not play football. So they had all the power on the team side. And until free agency came along, the, the, there's the apocryphal story of uh, Jim Ringo going in to negotiate his contract with Vince Lombardi of the old Green Bay Packers. And Ringo walks in and says, okay, I'd like to introduce you to my agent. And Lombardi says, well, give me a break for a few minutes. He comes back and he says, 
And Ringo says, well, can we talk about my contract? He said, we, Lombardi says, we have nothing to talk about. I just traded you to the Washington Redskins. <laughs> <laughs> that was basically the rights the players had, which were none. That's crazy. <laughs> Lee, um, I was just thinking, creative type. I, I can already tell that you have done, you're, you're also the creative type. You're always thinking outside the box, ways to create things. The agency role, nowadays, can you take that same concept with all the inventions that have made in the past 20 years plus with the internet? all these different things that are coming out, maybe a podcaster, right? Like these new influencers. Can you take that concept that you applied and stuck to the sports world of agency to sports agency, and then they had agency to entertainers and apply it to maybe some of the new type of influencers, uh, a podcast uh, agent, right? Well, Isn't there... Brand, you can brand anyone. And so now the currency in the economic market is followers. How many followers does someone have on TikTok or Instagram um, or uh, uh, Twitter? And so the whole concept is brand. It's establishing an athlete or a brand with a distinct uh, uh, identity and, and then monetizing um, monetizing that brand and so the point is that it's all about brand it's about monetizing um, that brand it's about curing followers and if you can can do that then it drives the market the, the economics of, of then it makes everything possible and we have a revolution on the college campuses, which is name, image, likeness. So all of a sudden, all the amateur athletes for the last 100 years have been replaced by the fact that every young athlete can, every young athlete can market themselves from high school on with a, uh, with a, uh, a, a marketing agent um, and and make their own deal. So all of a sudden, the whole concept of amateurism is gone because every high-profile young athlete at the college level and some at the high school level are marketing themselves. So this opens a broad new field that has not been uh, done before and revolutionized what's happening on the college campus. But to your point about new technology, so, so it means we can do virtual reality. We can take a athlete and create a app where you put on, you are not now the quarterback on the field at Arrowhead Stadium. And based on what you do with the football in your hand, you can either be sacked or overwhelmed or you can uh, throw a touchdown pass and it's a real experience so we can take virtual reality augmented reality and build new projects with it. thank you lee appreciate it all right lee uh, next question is about um what is the most rewarding deal that you've ever negotiated maybe in a minute or less um well I think those two deals back in 1984, when Warren Moon comes back into the NFL as the, uh, as the, after six years in Canada, the highest paid uh, player, because it's the first free agency deal, because free agency doesn't happen until 93 in football, but he's free because he never got drafted in the NFL. So we have the heady experience of going to 12 different uh, teams. Um, uh, well, you, of course, you have the Patrick Mahomes contract that was largely pioneered by uh, Chris Babbitt, my younger CEO, um, which was the biggest contract in sports history. Before 93, so there was no concept as, I'm, I apologize, there was no concept as free agency? And I, I'm not uh, big on in baseball. They had free agency 
much earlier after Andy oh. and Buster Smith. But um, and in basketball, they had it earlier. In football, it's not till the 93 collective bargaining agreement that free agency comes. Wow. Very interesting. Th thank you, Lee. Um, Lee, what, what were the, the hardest struggles that you overcame? Maybe one to two minutes. Um, it, it was understanding that you needed to keep fixed expenses low and profitability high. And that if, if I was out recruiting 100 players just straight out of college, that I might not sign a whole lot. So it was creating a profile of a young role model client that had a good heart that would respond to what I was talking about. And that if I could find, do research and find that kind of family and find that kind of player, I might have an 80% chance of, uh, of uh, making, uh, of signing that player. And if I was just talking to people that had no interest in role modeling or the rest, I might sign nobody. So it was making that adjustment. And then the second thing was the battle I had with alcohol. It was understanding that um, I had a problem and breaking denial and then working a 12 step program and, and uh, you know, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and that there was a way out of this if I, you know, worked a 12 step program and, and <clears throat> worked with a, a unique fellowship. Thank you, Lee. Appreciate that. Lee, next, next question. I'll go in a different direction. Best tips on negotiating any contract? Maybe one to two minutes. Is to hone your listening skills. So the goal is to, is to get into the heart and mind of the other person and uh, understand what their goals and priorities are. Um, so it, it means drawing out another person so you understand their deepest anxieties and fears and their greatest hopes and dreams. And so um, it, it's having a clear agenda for yourself about what your priorities are. Everything can't be as important as everything else. Um, and then on the other hand, it's understanding what's going to make this a win-win between you and the other side and trying to find a way to fulfill their goals while still maximizing your own objectives. Because if you can establish a paradigm of cooperation, most of us deal with the same figures over and over again in repetitive business. So the only sure thing is you're going to see the same person again in another context <laughs> later. So you better keep the relationship strong. So, so Lee, that, that's brilliant, by the way. There are certain situations in life, especially in politics, you have different leaders. This We don't talk about politics here, but different leaders that are running the world that, you know, they can't get along and they have to same scenario happens in families. There are family members that you can't detach from. If you, if you do a business deal with someone, you don't, you, and it doesn't work out, you can just move on, never see that person again. But in a family unit, just like the global unit at the political scene, there are people that might never be able to get along in life. And as you mentioned earlier, you know, your concept of negotiating, which I agree with, is there's negotiating is happening everywhere. Parents are negotiating with each other on the silliest detailed things. How do you negotiate with people that you just don't get along with, that people that are just impossible to get along with? You might have a rational mind, but they might not. We're assuming under your model, everybody's under the right, right mindset and thinking correctly. But what about those impossible people? How do you negotiate with them? Well, this is not a hypothetical question. Uh, this happens all the time. Um, so you've got to keep drawing the person out. Somewhere in this, you'll find a commonality. And if you keep, keep probing and probing, somewhere in the great constellation of values, you're going to find something that you can agree on. And it might be something like sports. Right? It might be something totally away from key principles, but there's going to be some commonality that you can relate to that person through. And so 
if you can establish a, a relationship based on uh, sports, or you both like woodworking, or you both like hunting, or you both like fishing, or you both like this, you may not get along on any other level, but if you can start with that commonality, maybe you can drop the fences a little bit and drop the uh, defenses to, to, to strike a better balance. There's got to be something um, that you, you know, get along on. I mean, I had a situation where I had to get along with this fellow. Well, turned out he liked wrestling. And uh, he liked old Western. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I had to go deep into my uh, understanding of uh, gun smoke and wagon train and uh, the big valley and, uh, and Clint Eastwood and, and understood the difference in wrestling divisions and all the rest of it. But I uh, studied it and, and, we could relate on those issues. And once we could relate on those issues, everything else became easy. Lee, that, that's a beautiful response. Folks, I hope you're listening to this. This is like billions of dollars in value can change the world. Literally what Lee just said in the last two minutes. <laughs> so thank you, Lee. I'm, I'm wholeheartedly in agreement with you. All right. Um, how important is ethics for, for those that have mastered the art of influencing others? Maybe a minute or less. Oh, I think it's, a, it's critically key. The worst thing in the world is situational ethics, where someone's nice to cats and dogs, they're good to their neighbors, they're a nice father, but they go out in the workplace and use social Darwin tactics, um, because after all, it's just business, and the end justifies the means. Um, um, I think that your word and your reputation are everything. So being honest, and uh, not lying and, and having a word that people can rely on. I mean, in sports, you do a lot of verbal deals. And so the ability to rely on your word is really important. And you have to do it over and over and over again. So uh, taking advantage of someone, I always have the philosophy, be kind to your future self. Do those little things today that will lead you down the road to uh, uh, success later. You don't want to build this whole pyramid of great success, but it's built on a lie or a misrepresentation, and then the whole thing falls. So it's when, when you're under pressure and temptation is to lie or to get out of the situation, don't do it, you know, because you, you'll get out of a tough situation. But if you, if you tell someone a lie and they know you're lying, they'll never trust you again. Oh, that that's beautifully said. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Lee, um, I just want to preface this question. Some people are naturally gifted at persuasion, but they have mistakenly used their talents incorrectly in their life. What message would you have for them who are afraid to use their talent again positively because they don't want to harm anyone again? So let, let me just set the stage for this. This is a long-winded question. Like in my own life, but I know there's a lot of folks that are like this. I'm sure you've bumped into it. When I was younger, I you know I grew up, in Philadelphia, times were tough. I went through a, a period where I was a lost, I was lost for a while. You know, my best friend killed himself when I was 18. So grew up on the streets and I got, I got lucky, but influence, I, I was, I had the ability to influence a lot of folks. And at that time I thought was best for them. And it probably didn't work out too well. Um, there's a lot of folks like that. They grow up, they have a hard time, especially I'm sure in the sports industry, there might've been a lot of folks that had a lot of influence on other folks. <clears throat> and when they, when things, if, if they influenced someone in the wrong direction later on in their, their life, they might be, they might've not wanted to use that gift, that natural gift they had to help others because they're afraid that they would do it again. They might lead someone to do drugs again. They might, they might lead someone to, to do things that they at a different mindset thought was okay, but wasn't any message for them. Well, every day, there's a period of time at the end of the day where I try to review the day and see, is there anyone that I was insensitive to? Is there anyone I was rude to? 
is there any interaction I had um, that that wasn't fair? Um, do I have any work I need to do in terms of making amends to anyone? So you can check your own motivation and you can question yourself. Um, and I do it every day and I have everyone in my office do it for me. You know, mm. was I off? Was I, uh, did you see something that you didn't understand or that was off? And so I'm making sure all the time that, um, that my actions are in uh, conformance and I encourage people to, to speak up if they ever see something that, that seems wrong or untoward or, or whatever. So that person who feels um, like in the past they've been uh, guilty of uh, bad advice or bad input, at the end of the day, they can just resolve that they're not going to do that anymore and, and just check their motivation. And if the motivation for the next piece of advice they give is, is positive and pure, uh, don't remove yourself from the world because you made one mistake. Thank you, Lee. Brilliant response. Lee, uh, I, I know that you're doing a lot of stuff with the brain, and we have Brett Farr on here, and Brett Farr's main message was about concussions, and that kind of opened my eyes when I had that discussion with him about how important it is, and I know what you're doing is kind of ties into that. What role does learning about the brain and concussions have on the future of sports? Um, I think that concussion is the existential threat to football. I had a crisis of conscience back in the 80s when I'm representing half the starting quarterbacks to keep getting hit in the head. And we would go to doctors and ask how many are too many, and they had no answers at that point. You know, that's the 80s during the 90s. So I started holding concussion conferences. And we held the first one in Newport Beach in 19, was it maybe 94? And Troy Aikman and Steve Young and Warren Moon and Drew Bledsoe and Rob Johnson and other players came and we had neurologists speak. And then in, this is about 2005, we finally got the answer that three or more led to an exponentially higher rate of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, premature senility, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and depression. And um, it, um, so I called it a ticking time bomb and undiagnosed narcolepsy. So I've continued to have 17, we now have had our 17th uh, brain health uh, conference. And I now discovered these two brain health stimulators, which I think can cure concussed brain. Now I'm not a doctor, but I think we've made progress. We have to cure this because if 50% of the mothers understand the relationship between a sport like football or hockey and brain damage and tell their kids you can play any sport but not tackle football. It won't kill football, but it'll turn it into a gladiator sport where only people from tough economic circumstances will play um, because they are desperate for the money. Mm. Thank you, Lee. Appreciate that. All right, Lee, next, next question. How do you conquer addictions? So one of the trends I noticed... Uh, a lot of very successful people that I've interviewed, not just on here, but um, as I started doing this clubhouse stages, all that stuff, um, a lot of people became extremely successful and then had some kind of addiction problem, either the whole way through or they just hit a, a complete, you know, pinnacle at one point in their life. And, and it just came, it resurfaced heart very strongly. Um, you, you've obviously overcame this, but uh, so how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you overcome addiction? Maybe you have a message for those out there that, that have store are suffering from this. The first key is breaking denial because uh, like if it's alcohol or drugs, these are the diseases that tell you you don't have a disease. And so it's very hard to, to admit to yourself, uh, not because you're trying to deny it, but but because the drug or the alcohol is confusing your brain to the point where you're not playing with a full deck. So you have to break denial first. And for me, it was a matter of proportionality. 
that I, I had these admonitions, you know, be a good parent, be a good friend, um, make a difference in the world. And I wasn't a Spartan peasant in Darfur. I didn't have a last name Steinberg in Nazi Germany in the late 30s. I wasn't sick in any way. What excuse did I have to, to not come back to life? And then you have to be willing to do the work. And there are 12-step programs that work, but you need to abandon everything. Hit whatever bottom is your bottom where it becomes uh, unacceptable to live that way anymore. And then just do the work of the 12-step program. There are people out here who will help you. You don't have to do this alone. Um, there, there are people in that unique fellowship that will support you. Uh, I had plenty of help. And, uh, and you have to have some sense of resilience and optimism that amidst all the detritus and destruction, you can see light at the end of the tunnel. So having a little bit of optimism, even in the darkness, is, is a help. But just stick to the program. And uh, ultimately, if you do the work, um, uh, you'll come to a brighter future. And uh, so if anyone's out there struggling uh, because of program problem they have with addictive substances, I was there too. You can uh, recover. Uh, just reach out wherever you are and you can get help. And Lee, you, you really did. I mean, I was listening to it, another version of your story on a different interview. Um, you really did hit rock bottom. I mean, you went from one, being a superstar agent to bankrupt, I believe, right? Sleeping in an apartment. Well, yeah, what I did when I realized what my problem was, I gave up my agency, I gave up my house, uh, I went back to my parents. I'm 61 years old. That oh, my, uh, my father, sitting on my deceased father's uh, uh, bed in, in my parents' house, uh, and my only thought was where I could find more vodka. And, uh, you know, from that, uh, life's gotten a little happier now. <laughs> so, Lee, I had uh, Tim Story. I had, we designed a big stage on, on Clubhouse. Tim Story's like Oprah's good friends. Um, he, uh, celebrity mentor, his main message has been from setback to comeback. That's his whole thing, thing in his theme. <clears throat> so my question for you, I, I think you, you'd be perfect for this question. How do you go from a setback to a comeback, a slightly different question. The last question, and more in general, how do you go from getting a major setback to coming and, and a major comeback? Because you're do, you're doing great now. Again, uh, I think it's a sense of resilience um, that it's a belief you, that you might still have something to offer the world. But then I think it's being realistic about. So if I'm going to go back and represent athletes, I'm going to have to be prepared for. Uh, how can you guarantee that you won't um, uh, end up drinking again, which, of course, you can't uh, guarantee, or you've been out of the profession six years, are you still relevant, or you didn't manage your own money well, how can you manage ours? Well, I don't manage money, we have financial planners do that, um, but, but you have to take every I don't have a divine right to represent athletes. They have a need. So you have to be brutally honest with yourself about what your situation is and prepare to respond to all that. Um, and, um, um, and still, if you can envision in my profession, taking a young person, listening to them, getting a holistic sense for what their hopes and dreams are and their anxieties and fears are and sketch out a future that embodies a draft and, and uh, charitable role modeling and take them all the way to a fulfilling second career, um, then you, you might find someone who will respond. That's a brilliant response. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Lee, as, as an extension to that question, so what is the importance of a great reputation? How important is that? And, and where does trust tie into that? Maybe a minute. I think it's critically important. And, uh, it's not like I 
my problems with self-destructiveness wasn't that I ethically took somebody's money or hurt them or ruined them or committed crimes or did things like that. So once you remove the addiction, then what's the basic nature of your character? Um, and uh, I'm all about how can I help you and, and what can I do to improve your situation? And how can I make your life more meaningful? So um, it, it um, had it been something else than substance abuse, you might have some many more problems uh, reintegrating in the world. But um, um, it's, um, I don't believe in social Darwinism in the workplace. There are um, limits to, to, I don't consider it to be war. Um, it's, um, I want to aspire to, you know, a, a better world and make a, a positive difference. Yeah, and, and Leah, I, I asked you this question because you have an interesting scenario, exactly the way you described it. It's like you were still always great at the core. You just had a self-destructive tendency. So for that reason, you maintained your great reputation for who you are at the core. Once you fix that problem, but you're right, like just if I can sum this up properly, I, I hope if you had a different uh, situation, if your character was off from the beginning, you might not have came back so fast. I think that's right. And plus, I waited um, uh, three years into sobriety before even trying. So I wanted to make sure in my own mind that I was following a program. Um, and I had dealt with the main issue because look, here, here's the thing. When people talk about my comeback, my comeback was maintaining sobriety and being a good father to my kids. If nothing else had ever happened, it was enough. Brilliant. Thank you, Lee. Appreciate that. Lee, um, how do you stay on top? Maybe you have uh, some advice for people who are on top and they're, they're, they're about to fall. Like, what, Any thoughts on them to keep them up there? I think you have to go back to your core values and believe that what you're doing uh, makes a difference in the world and believe that you're bringing good into the world and that um, uh, and and using that energy and passion for what you're doing to, to energize you, to keep yourself um, uh, uh, working hard and, and, uh, and continually be listening to, uh, to the people around you. I think that um, my most important skill is listening and being aware of what's happening around me and not um, falling into uh, believing that I know everything. Life is a learning experience and I'm always learning and I have to be aware of how fast this world is changing and how fast our communication is changing and how fast the business world and markets are changing. So I read six newspapers uh, <laughs> a day and- wow bunch of magazines and, and try to stay in touch because um, change is not linear anymore. It's exponential. Wow. That's incredible. All right, Lee. So we're at the, uh, the pinnacle. I'm going to ask you some temple questions. Now, these are the questions that I've asked to every, mostly everyone on this podcast. Um, so uh, let's see. So these, this really starts to tie into writing, uh, business, and finance. Can one book change the world? Maybe 30 seconds or so. That's incredible. Thank you, Lee. All right, Lee, uh, what role has networking played in your life? Now, I think you're, I just want to preface this question uh, perfectly for you, because uh, I know that you've networking, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but networking 
Um, meaning that like connecting the people, the ability to bump into the right people and have them support you along your journey. It, let's just take a, a, the next Michael Jackson. Let's say he's standing on the corner. Okay. He's standing on the corner. He's, he's, he's Michael Jackson. He's playing great songs, but without the ability to connect with that right person, this person may or may not ever be a superstar. Would you agree with that? And again, I go back to the question, how, how important, uh, what role has networking played in your life? Maybe you can merge those two together. Sorry to shotgun questions. Eddie. Networking has meant everything to me. It's the ability to, to be out and around and to try to connect with as many different people and in a very short period of time, try to find some commonality. It's asking the right questions. It's bonding. It's collecting cards. It's writing on the back of the cards who the person was so you can follow up. Um, it's, uh, I, I happened to go Sunday night to the, uh, to the uh, Charger uh, game and, uh, and they played the Kansas City Chiefs. So in the box I was in was Donald Brand who owns the Irvine company that dominates most of uh, Orange County. Um, you know, we had a chance to meet and to talk. He was with David Schreier, our next longtime uh, congressman. In the next box was Henry Winslow with my car and, uh, and some other folks. So keeping moving um, and, and relationship um, is, is everything. It's, uh, to me, I've given 4,000 speeches and being part of those crowds means that I get phone calls from people in all sorts of business contexts that I haven't stimulated because there are relationships out there. And uh, am amazing things happen if you're on a plane, if you're, uh, 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 if you can afford it, flying first class from LA to New York, you will always meet someone in Factor. Um, but you know, getting out, going to banquets, going to charitable fundraisers, meeting people, spending time one-on-one, -on -one, looking them in the eye, not getting distracted by how much is going on around you, but making contact for that one moment, getting a little bit of commonality going, collecting someone's card or doing that thing with the phone where the establish a contact. Um, it's propelled my life in every direction imaginable. Brilliant response. Thank you, Lee. As an extension that is, is mentoring important and who, who were some of your mentors? Maybe 30 uh, seconds. Well, my father was a big mentor, but we do aging academies bringing along the next generation of uh, Sports professionals with ethics and values. Just did one in Las Vegas. I do sports career conferences. I've spoken on 85 campuses. I want to be part of helping that next generation uh, make an impact through the power of sports. So um, we have interns uh, in our office. We have hundreds of them, and they go on and do great things. We're trying to give them a methodology plus inspire them that they can make things better and different uh, so it, it's important though you would say right to have a mentor to have a mentor absolutely i've had from my high school civics teacher to professors at uh, law school um, i've been immeasurably helped by people and on the other end pass it on thank you lee Lee, uh, what are your favorite financial books? Now, I don't know if, if, you're, if you've read financial or I also include investing money, business books. Any favorite books at all in that area? Um, uh, uh, and if no, that's okay. <laughs> okay. All right. And by the way, I got to send you a copy of my, uh, my books too. I'd, I'd be happy to send it to you. Then I'll have an answer for the next <laughs> I love it. Thanks, Lee. All right, Lee. Next question. Do we need money to survive? You need money to pay your bills. Um, but at the time 
time I've had the most money, I haven't necessarily been the happiest. I mean, there was a year that um, I think I took home $80 million and uh, wasn't the happiest time in my life. So I think happiness is based on spiritual values. Happiness is based on on family and friendship and uh, a belief that, that you're doing the right thing. So money is stored for time. And so having enough is necessary. Having more than enough allows you to not waste time and to live in ways that maximize your time. Mm. I like that. I like that concept. Thank, thank you, Lee. Uh, is finance necessary for everyone? Now, when I talk about finance, I'm talking about the science of finance. So you think everyone needs to learn about this stuff? Yes, I think that a basic understanding of in a free enterprise system and a capitalistic system. And if that's the system, you better understand it. <laughs> and you better um, understand ways to, you know, the basics of, of, of how capitalism works and how um, money flows in uh, an economy and the basics of how to build and run a, a business and, and uh, the uh, essence of uh, investment, investment capital, and it's just, it's, uh, if, if you're going to go out and be entrepreneurial, you better understand the concepts government wants. That's brilliant. Thank you, Lee. Lee, just a few more questions, almost done here, uh, about purpose now. So you mentioned purpose and its importance, but how important is having a purpose in business, and then what would be your purpose, if you can state my purpose is, maybe one second. My purpose business is to uh, in, enhance the lives of young athletes and put them on the right path to lifelong success. And it's also to try to make a meaningful difference in the world. The fact that we can do social and community programs that make a difference in the world gives me passion and gives me energy and makes me believe in the work I do. And it's the fundamental underpinning of the fact that, that um, I believe in our mission. So if it's the environment, I set up the Sporting Green Alliance to take sustainable technology and wind, solar, um, resurfacing, uh, uh, and uh, water, and uh, recycling and integrated into sports um, arenas, stadia, and practice facilities to drop carbon emissions and energy costs and transform those platforms into educational platforms where fans can see a waterless urinal or a solar panel and think about how to integrate those concepts into their own home and school. So um, they can you put sports in the forefront of rolling back climate change. So if you believe you're in a position to change circumstances, whether it's bullying or sex trafficking or domestic violence or racism or whatever, then there's a larger purpose. Um, and, it, it, uh, um, and you feel like you're doing good in the world. So, but anyone who's starting a business, would you, would you agree that they should have a purpose aligned with whatever they want to do in life? That would help them out a lot better. I think that the purpose, if, if what your product does inherently helps the world, that's a good thing. You know, if you're in biomed or you're in uh, some area of agriculture, or you're in something that has a positive social function, or if you're simply going to make a lot of money, but you're going to do good things with it. That's also a purpose. That's brilliant. Thank you, Lee. N n uh, two more questions left, Lee. Last one is, um, what do you like to accomplish in the next 10 years or so and why? Um, so cause driven, I'd like to, to help push a revolution in preventative health so that people find all of these different protocols and modalities so they 
stop from ever getting sick from having cancer and heart disease in the first place um, and live longer, more productive lives. And then I want to tackle some of those baseline issues we just referenced and use sports to make a difference in them. And then I'd like to produce more books, more content that inspires people uh, to make changes for the better. How about Jerry Maguire, part two? <laughs> well, we're talking about a movie. Now, Cameron will never do a sequel. He's pretty adamant about that. So there won't be an official Jerry Maguire 2. But we're talking to people about all sorts of uh, programming that could be based around the life or experiences of a sports agent. So mm. <laughs> that would be a great sequel, though. I mean, a lot's changed the past 30 years, right? I mean, so, <laughs> all right. That yeah 20 yeah 25 years so lee last question what would you like to be your legacy to this world like if you can tell the you know look at your gravestone uh coming back after you pass and you look at it and had this one message to tell everybody and and you want to create this for everyone to see and and believe in what what, what, what would you like to be your legacy to this world he was a good father and tried to heal the pain of others That's brilliant. Thank you, Lee. Lee, I just want to conclude. I, I appreciate and I just want to let you know I, I'm honored to have you here today. I'm very, very grateful. And Thanksgiving is two days from now. So this is perfect for, for me and our community. <laughs> so um, thanks again. I appreciate you being here. And I want to leave the floor for you. At the, anything you want to talk about, promote, whatever it may be. If you want to tell us about where you, they can find more information about you, websites, uh, social media, the floor is yours, Lee. Well, and Instagram and, and Twitter and all the usual uh, suspects. <laughs> and, um, and you can uh, find us on the internet at Lee, L-A-I-J, at cyberspeak.com. And we do agent academies and we do sports career conferences and we have an online course you can take and all the rest of it. So mostly be happy. That's incredible. Thank you, Lee. And, and possibly, folks, I'm trying to talk Lee into possibly getting the clubhouse as well to the Friday night masterclass. So stay tuned. <laughs> All right, Lee. So thanks again. I appreciate you being here. And we're, we're going to conclude. If you just want to uh, hang out, I'll meet you in the, the green screen in just a second. Folks, you, Dr. Anthony created fourth here, also known as Dr. Finance. You're on the Dr. Finance Live podcast. You can get more information about this podcast on drfinance.info and all the information on the brand itself. Also, thank you for being here. Don't forget to follow, like, and subscribe and comment. Check out Lee's website as well and give him a follow on his social media platforms. If you're interested in learning more about finance, check out The Necessity of Finance. I wrote my first book for my finance students about 10 years ago. And then The Most Important Lessons in Economics and Finance just a year later. My final book in 2016 was about the survival of the richest, a long 500 plus page book tying in economics finance, biology, and uh, saving the world. A lot of stuff. So with that said, uh, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Lee, again. Appreciate you. We'll see you on the next episode, folks. Thanks again now. Bye-bye now.